our righteous and merciful, patient Heavenly Father. Lord, we declare that you see us this morning. We know that you are looking down upon us, that you are even here in our midst on this Lord's Day, and as we gather to discuss the advancement of the kingdom, the the mission of the church. Lord, I pray that you'd bless this time. Lord, it would not be a wasted time, Lord. I pray that you would use this to prepare our hearts to gather corporately soon to worship in spirit and in truth, to give our gifts, to pray, to, to sing, to hear the word preached and read. Lord, I pray that you would deliver us from distractions. Please clear away distractions in our hearts and minds, Lord. It is not worthy of you to be worshiping you and thinking of you with distracted hearts and minds, Lord. And we have many things to be distracted about in this church, Lord. And I pray that you would give us a few hours, Lord, at least, just of time to concentrate on the pure, holy worship of the triune God. I pray that you'd bless this time, Lord, and that you'd help me teach this class and we'd have a good discussion. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, before I begin, I wanted to uh, remind you guys that uh, we're going to hopefully be having a few more missionaries come here. So what I'm doing today is going to be kind of a follow-up to our first three Sundays. And if someone would be able to run the mic, because I don't have... Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Because we're going to do, hopefully, a time of kind of discussion. So next slide, please. So... The reason why I wanted to take this Sunday to discuss things with you guys is we watched, essentially we've watched two documentaries and then we've had a live missionary come and speak to us. So there's been a lot of information shared with us, there's been a lot of things heard, and there's been some questions that have come to me, and so I wanted to take this time to kind of slow down, let's review what we've heard already, and discuss why, why we're doing these things. Why are we listening to these Missionaries coming, why we watched the Heart Cry film, why did we watch the C.T. Studd documentary. And so once again, I thought I was going to have the book with me this morning, and I forgot it again. So, but off of memory, we're, what we're doing here is we're discussing, number one, the mission of the church. So the mission of the church is to spread a, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, that all the nations might come and worship the one true God. That's God's mission. We kind of discussed this the first Sunday school then under that umbrella of the mission of the church, there's missions, which is activities that the church engages in to further the mission of the church, that all nations, all peoples, all languages would come and worship the true God of the Bible. And then under that, there's a smaller subset of missionaries who distinctly are called and are the ones sent out to fulfill this task, who are gifted for that role, who are the ones who are going to be planting churches, preaching the gospel, and so on and so forth. So understanding missions in that way, it's not just only missionaries that are involved in missions, the whole church is involved with missions. We all have a role to play, we're gonna discuss that more today of why we're watching all of this, because questions have come essentially saying, um, you know, that's great, I don't feel like I'm called to be a missionary, so what, what is the point of some of these documentaries outside of trying to get certain people to go? And it was a great question, and I feel like I've not clarified that well enough, so We're going to hopefully hone on that here. So if you can go next slide, please. Thanks, Stacey. So I wanted to remind you guys of the goals of the missions team uh, that we have here at Oak Ridge. Uh, The first that's pertinent to our study today is that we want to find ways to get the whole congregation engaged with with missions in general and and supporting the current missionaries that we have. And so that's one of the goals here. So if we're going to be more engaged as a whole body in missions, we need to understand what's going on in the world. We need to understand the history of missions. We need to understand what's going on with our current missionaries and their needs. And we need to understand and have discernment in how we give and how we pray. So again, these Sunday schools are not just for people that may be considering going to the missions field. I know that the, probably the vast majority of us are not going to go to the missions field but we still have a role to play in missions, and that is one of, the purpose, one of the purposes of our Sunday schools. You can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So then the second goal of the mission team is to develop a system whereby we may encourage, inspire, and recognize members in our own congregation who may be called and gifted to become missionaries and then establish partnerships to help train up and send out and support them. So even though I know that probably the vast majority of us will not be sent to the missions team, we still do want to make room and want to seek and hope and pray that there would be even some among us, even here, that would be stirred for missions. 
that may have a dormant desire to go and they don't realize it yet or maybe awakened for the, the gifting and the calling that they have in their life and that we at Oak Ridge would have an on-ramp for them and not just send them off to a missionary organization. We never really you know, stay in much contact with them outside of kind of a monthly update and things like that. We want to actually be able to develop a system here at Oak Ridge to help raise up from within and be the primary senders of missionaries. We're not quite there yet, but that is one of our goals. So as our whole con- the whole congregation here, these mornings that we're taking to look at missionaries in the past, to look at missionary organizations, it's also to help develop a system whereby we can, the whole congregation, come together and help support and train up missionaries in our midst. Finally, last slide here for this section. C, continue to develop ways in which we can strengthen our support and ties to our current missionaries and potential new missionaries we may take on. So as we hopefully by the end of the summer we'll have current missionaries that we support as a church coming to talk with us, we want to find ways for that not only are we just praying in general at our prayer meetings for them, but we're actually becoming acquainted with our missionaries that we're staying in touch with them, that we know their needs distinctly, they know, we know their families, we know their, their prayer requests, and we're actually able to stay in contact with them. There may be some developments coming uh, that we could do where we like do something like a Barnabas team, I'll explain that later. But we, as a whole congregation, I feel like need to be more engaged with missions. There's so much opportunity, there's so much need, and there's so much gifting that we have in this congregation that I feel like we need to connect the two. So those are kind of the the reminders of the goals that we have as a missions team. And so now I want to hone in a little bit more of why we're doing these Sunday schools. So if you can go to the next slide, thank you. So the point of these Sunday school sessions is to, one, to get all of us more acquainted and involved with our current missionaries and also expose us to other missionaries and missions organizations. So as a Christian uh, for the last nine years myself, I have been greatly blessed and encouraged when I've been introduced to certain missionary organizations to learn about the work of God around the world. And some people have used this term, you may not like it, but I'll just use it as becoming a global Christian, a globally minded Christian, to know what's going on in the kingdom of God around the world, even if you're not called to go. It's a great blessing. You're engaged with the work of God globally, and that's what we want to be here. Even if you're not called to go, that you would know what's going on in Indonesia that you would know what's going on in China, that you would know what's going on in Nigeria, in Afghanistan, so that you can pray intelligently, that you can give in a discerning manner, and to kind of look through, okay, all of these organizations around the world are claiming that they're missionary organizations. We need to make sure that we're not giving our money or spending time and energy supporting things that really isn't missions, or is something that is claiming to be that and really is not. So there's a lot of value in having discernment and taking Sunday schools, nine Sunday schools, to go through missions and not just spend one Sunday school talking about it and then thinking everyone's good. So this is the reason why we are going through these films. We are looking at what real missionaries look like, what real mission organizations look like. Second slide, please. Secondly, to introduce us to missionaries from the past and their lives of faithfulness, which the Lord used and blessed. I'm sure you guys have heard this uh, Potentially, but John Piper is famous for saying that uh, Hebrews 11 basically is a command for us to read Christian biographies. And the sense with what I'm trying to get at here is that when we look at the missionaries of the past, we are learning what God has done throughout time. We're looking at his faithfulness and what he's promised to do to advance the kingdom of his son. And when we look at these old missionaries, we can see how did they finish? Did they finish well? And if they finished well and they did the Lord's will, we need to emulate how they lived their lives. We need to look at how they did missions. It's just like with any other port of theology. You can do your exegesis. You can understand the systematic understanding of what the scriptures are teaching. But you also need historical theology kind of as the the railings on the side to keep us in. We we look at what God has done through the church. So that's why we're going to look at some missionary uh, biographies and see what God has done. So... C.T. Studd is the one we looked at last week. And the reason why I wanted to show C.T. Studd is because it showed a missionary near the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, who did great things from the Lord and impacted multiple continents. So C.T. Studd was very ambitious. He was very blessed and used of God. And I felt like he was a great example to introduce us to the biography of missionaries. Was he perfect? No. Was there things we probably would disagree with him about? Yes. But the point is, I was hoping that as you watched that your souls were stirred 
And if you don't feel called to go and be a missionary, that you're like, wow, I want to be able to be a supportive player in something like that. And then finally, number three here, the point of these Sunday schools, this is that in all these things, those of us who may be called to missions might be awakened to the potential dormant desire within us to go and to get a foretaste of what it would be like to go and to begin the process of preparing to go. So my hope and prayer is that truly we would have someone or a family here at Oak Ridge that would be felt called and gifted to go and that through these Sunday schools they would see the faithfulness of God and these missionaries in the past. They would see missionary organizations like Heart Cry. They would see the current missionaries we support or ones that are wanting to go on the field and that they would be stirred with the desire to go and be like, I feel like God is calling me to do that. I have the giftings, I believe, and then we can begin that discussion and we would love to see that happen. Sorry, my apologies. One more here. Number four. And very importantly, for the 90% plus of us, 99% of us here, for those of us not called to be missionaries, these Sunday schools are intended to stir our affections and keep the fire in our hearts going for missions and to keep our minds informed so that we would be more intelligible in our giving praying and discerning as we seek to be globally minded Christians and invest in the kingdom of God and hold the rope for those who are going into the mine. So that's, that's my heart behind all these things, that this wouldn't just be a blip on the radar, okay, we did mission Sundays and now we're on to September Sunday schools, uh, October, November, is that this really does stoke a fire in your heart to remain connected to the mission of the church. Uh, there's tons of resources, again, out on those tables out there. Those aren't just meant to be like a museum. You look at them. We hope that you pick them up, that you read them, that you look through them. It, it really, there, there's really not many things outside of reading missionary biographies and reading what God is doing in the, the current world right now that we're in that really stirs your heart. God is doing great things, and to miss out on that and to not know about it is really a tragedy. I, I, I love to hear updates of what's going on in the world, the s souls being saved, the, the people groups that have never heard the gospel, hearing and believing and coming in droves to Christ and seeing fulfillment of prophecy and all of these things. So again, this is, this is for our good, and this is so that we might be more intelligible givers, prayers, and discerners, because we all have a role to play. We all, each and every one of us in this room has a role to play in missions. And this is what we're trying to get across in the first Sunday school. This isn't just something like, where, where do missions fit in my life? It's where do we fit in the mission of God? That really is what we have to be thinking about these things, even if you're not called to go. Where is my giving playing a role in this? Where is my praying playing a role in this? Where, how am I encouraging others maybe to go to the missions field? I mean, this is, that's actually part of your role too. Even if you're not called to go, how do you support other people that may be called to go? So we're going to take a quick break here in the sense of from what I'm going to be teaching. And if there truly is some discussion that needs to happen over the CT stud film, I'd like to do that now. So if anyone would have any questions, maybe Chris can run the mic and we can kind of discuss maybe what you felt, what you thought, what maybe uh, prodded you as you were watching the CT stud documentary. I know we finished basically with like two minutes left to go last Sunday. There wasn't really time to talk about it much. So I wanted to give at least 5, 10, 15 minutes to discuss the CT stud film. If there's not much more, we do have other things today we can definitely talk about, which I'm prepared to teach on. So I wanted to give that opportunity. Anything that you thought, anything that convicted you or maybe disagreed with, you liked or were encouraged by with CT stud? Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, so, you know, CT stud, uh, he basically lived, uh, you know, the... Uh, what Paul said, right, like, I consider everything to be lost to know Christ so that I might gain Christ, right? I mean, he went to, what, uh, three continents or two, two continents? Uh, China, India, and Africa, yeah. So, yeah, okay, yeah. almost three continents, yeah. right? Yeah, it's, it's no mean feat, right? Like, being a missionary, going to one foreign culture itself is something uh, like, you know, a lifetime <laughs> achievement, really. You know, going to three different cultures and uh, the kind of impact that he's had, you know, like the, the WEC, you know, giving yeah. away all of his fortune, millions at that time, right? Yeah. Uh, just see how he not only uh, truly believed in, yes. you know, what our Lord said about, uh, you know, um, having treasure in heaven. Yeah. 
he lived it, right? You know, it is definitely a great uh, inspiration. Like you said, maybe not all of us are called to go, but we can, uh, you know, at the least, I think we can all pray and give yes. and encourage, right? Amen. Yeah, just want to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe along those lines, I, I, what stood out to me last week was um, that Stud made the greatest impact on the culture and the world from which he came yeah. by not being conformed right. to the typical thinking of that culture, right? So mm -hmm. very often we feel the temptation to be like people around us in order to make greater inroads with them, right. uh, have a better relationship with them, somehow find a way to mm -hmm. show that we're not really a whole lot different than they are. We just have Jesus and that's, you know, trying to bring them right. into Jesus more easily. But the, the greater impact is made whenever we're radically countercultural and, and different. And we let, we let the light of the gospel shine and expose Amen. you know, the culture from, from which we're coming. So I, that just stood out to me. I, I really appreciated yes. seeing that in his life. Amen. Yeah, I think there was a quote that wasn't mentioned in the film. Paul Washer talks about this where C.T. Studd, at this point he's in Africa and his, I believe his daughter's being married and he's, you know, being, the daughter's being given in marriage and they're coming to, you know, tell him that and he goes into his hut to find a gift to give to the married couple and he comes out and he says, I, I don't have anything to give to you. I gave it all to Christ years ago. He had nothing to even give to his daughter. I mean, he was living in that, even in that point in his life, still fully sold out to the Lord. Um, yeah, it, it, like Lamar said, even if we're not called to go, that pattern of self-sacrifice, of giving oneself to the work of the Lord in any area that you're called to, and just being countercultural in the sense that when he, before he left England, he went on that preaching tour through Cambridge and all these in, institutions, just basically challenging people, what are you living for? Are you living for eternity? Are you living for the now? And so you don't have to be a missionary to say those things and to live like that. And so I, I hope yeah, that there was application to your souls um, when you saw that. So thank you. Joe's got one here. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I think the thing I found most remarkable was his severe physical ailments yeah. and that most of us would have just given up and gone back. Yes. And he literally killed himself yeah. by staying out in the field and serving. Yeah. And it's yeah. and the one thing that came to my mind, he, Dwight Moody, Dwight L. Yeah. Moody, had an impact on him. And Dwight is, I believe this is a correct quote. Said, "It's hard to understand what God can do through someone who is fully committed to God." And I think C.T. Studd shows mm -hmm. us exactly what that looks like. Amen. Yeah, and we even saw that with the, the first missionary uh, documentary we watched with uh, the brother from Big Lake, Minnesota, who has gone to the northern Korowai people, uh, just the suffering he's went through. I mean, to get bitten by, yeah, I, I can't remember his name, but uh, to get bitten by mosquitoes, to have malaria multiple times, and to get Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is essentially full, like body paralysis, and to continue to go back, I mean, that's... That's incredible. I mean, I, I yeah, it, it's, it, it's a convicting reality because I feel like many of us could easily make the excuse, well, I have a, a severe ailment, call it quits. And these guys just kept going. I mean, CT said had a heart attack on the mission field and just got back up, kept going. <laughs> Very convicting. I just gotta say, one of, the, one of the things that actually stuck out to me was that he, he and his wife were separated for 11 years, I think it said, in, in, yeah. on different continents. And I just, I, I find it, I don't know, it, it struck me because, you know, b because it seemed like God kept their marriage strong even when they didn't see each other for 11 years, you know, and I think, I mean, that in of itself is a testament, right? <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting fact. I'm not, yeah, I, I don't want to be critical, but that is quite an interesting reality that lived apart for 11 years. That's... I'm sure there's a lot of details we don't know, but yeah, the fact that they stayed faithful to one another and that the Lord still blessed them in that. Um, yeah, it, it, and I think, um, I don't want this to turn into either like looking at these, these men like they are some like superhumans that we could never be like. They were just like us. You know, it's just like exactly, it's what are you fully committed to the Lord? The Lord can do anything through anyone that's fully committed to him. And 
the Lord can do anything through any of us. So it's not like these are superhumans and you know, we're looking at them and worshiping them. No, these are, these are ordinary people like you and me. And it's just what is impossible for man is possible with the Lord. So We can do a few more here, a few more questions. We got making good time this morning. So. Going ones. Good discussion. Well, yeah, that I, I'm happy that you guys got stuff out of that. You know, I was very greatly touched when I watched that over a year ago, and I'm very happy I got the opportunity just to share that with you guys. And again, I think uh, Grant's taken advantage of this with his family. We have QR, a little sheet out there, uh, full of eight different QR codes that bring you to different prominent missionary documentaries that are free online on YouTube that you can easily pull up on your phone and watch. They're very well done, uh, very similar to the CT t Stud documentary where they go over their lives. Some of them are dramatized, but they're very encouraging and they're very convicting, and we don't have time to go through all of them this summer at all. I mean, I don't know if we'll go to any, we'll even get to watch another one with some of the things we're gonna be doing, so please take advantage of that. They're free, uh, and uh, it's just within a few seconds you can have it up on your phone or your laptop, so, okay. So the second half of the Sunday School this morning, we're going to talk about the 1040 window, which was meant, mentioned in the CT stud documentary. And Bunny Schneider came up to me afterwards and was very, very adamant that we should talk about this. And I agree with her. She's not here today, but that's okay. Um, we're going to talk about the 1040 window. Perhaps some of you know about this already. Maybe you guys don't know about it. It's very important that you do know about it. So what I'm going to be presenting here is simply just from the uh, joshuaproject.net. So this is uh, an organization that tracks statistics for unreached people groups around the world. Uh, and they have a great section on their website uh, about the 1040 window. So we're going to take some time to study the 1040 window and why it's important and why we should care about it. And then obviously, please feel free during this time to interrupt me, to ask questions, to discuss and we'll do like a Q&A at the end before we finish. So next slide, please. So the 1040 window, what is it? The 1040 window is the rectangular area of North Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, approximately between 10 degrees north and 40 degrees north latitude. The 1040 window is often called the res uh, resistant belt. It includes the majority of the world's Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists. The original 1040 window included only countries with at least 50% of their land mass within the 1040 degrees north latitude. The revised 1040 window includes several additional countries that are close to 10 or 40 degrees north latitude and have high concentrations of unreached peoples. See the original and revised country lists on the webpage. So that's the simple definitions of it, that those 10 and 40 degree latitudes on the globe we're looking at, there's this section of the, the earth essentially where there's a vast majority of unreached people groups. It's basically the concentration, yep, thank you for the slide there, the, the, uh, the concentration of the most unreached people groups on earth is right there. And what you'll notice is that some of those regions actually during the you know, beginning of the church were some of the most reached, like North Africa, Turkey, the Middle East, even parts of the, you know, Iran, and even I think Greece is mentioned on there now that's the expanded part of the 1040 window. So what we're looking at here is 2,000 years later, after the church has been you know, inaugurated, where are we at? Well, the Lord's done an amazing work. The, the, the gospel has spread really throughout the world, but there is still a large concentration of billions of people in this window here that have either not heard the gospel or there's a very, very, very small Christian or evangelical witness. And so this is where I need to pause here for a second. I appreciate the Joshua Pro uh, Project and others like this. I'm not sure 100% about this, but they are trying to concentrate on evangelical believers. So they're not mostly counting like Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic and things like that. Some mission organizations do. They kind of like, well, if anyone's even professing any form of Christianity, you know, they're reached or they've got a witness there. Uh, organizations like Operation World and Joshua Project try and concentrate on are there evangelical believers in these areas? Are there evangelical witnesses to the gospel in these people groups? 
And so that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about a general kind of Christian witness. Like, you know, if you go to Egypt, they have the Coptic Church, which is an ancient church that has been in Egypt. They're heretical. They're a Christological heresy is what they're built on. But, or the Roman Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church. We're not talking about that. We're talking about evangelical believers who believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the inerrancy of the scriptures, the need for personal conversion, and to be born again. And a, and a holy life that follows after that justification by faith. Yep, Joe. So is Russia considered? So I would say that in this statistic, Russia is there is believers in Russia. It's not quite the level that we'll get to here with the percentages of what is in the 1040 window. Yeah, Russia. Eastern Orthodox, heavy Eastern Orthodox, not exactly the most evangelical you know, country on earth, but for our purposes this morning and for what the 1040 window is talking about, we're talking about the high concentrations of unreached people that have never heard the gospel. There is no evangelical witness. But yeah, Russia, there's still work to be done in Russia. So this is not supposed to be like every country that, you know, isn't predominantly evangelical. It's where is the highest density of people that have never heard the gospel or there's the most darkness, if spiritual darkness, that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Um, by evangelical, do you mean um, evangelical indigenous people or pe uh, missionaries coming in from the outside? That's a good question. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I need to double check that. I'm pretty sure that what's being referred to here, and we'll read more about the 1040 window, is that if there is any evangelical witness, whether it's from the West, like outside, or if there is an indigenous witness from amongst their own people group, I think it includes both. But we will discuss the fact that the mo there is a movement in missions to look at the need of countries and people groups and to look at whether they're reached or not by, is there an indigenous church? Is there an actual organic movement amongst the people themselves not being solely propelled by a, a Western evangelical quote unquote country? So that's a good question. I, I think it includes both, but I, I do need to get probably back to you on that there, Mike, so. All right, good questions. All right, so some t statistics in the 1040 window. Approximately 5.32 billion individuals reside in the 8,882 distinct people groups that are in the revised 1040 window. 6,147 or 69% of these people groups are considered unreached and have a population of 3.28 billion people. This means approximately 62% of the individuals in the 1040 window live in an unreached people group. The 1040 window is home to some of the largest unreached people groups in the world. I'm going to butcher these, such as the Shaka, the Yadava, the Turks, the Moroccan Arabs, the Pashtun, the Jat, and the Burmese. So that's a huge percentage. That's a large amount of people. I mean, right now there's 8 billion people living, or over 8 billion people living on Earth right now. And we're talking over 3 billion that are considered unreached. So as much as the church has advanced, as much as the gospel has spread throughout the world in 2,000 years, there's, there's still a great task to be done. Now, I am no expert, and I am, this is simply opinion. And I've talked with other missionaries about this. These are good statistics. We need to be looking at people groups. We need to be looking at are they reached or unreached. We need to really be dividing people in ethnic groups, not just simply geopolitical countries. But there is nothing, we don't have an exact category or statistic in the scriptures to divide what does God mean by all the ethnics, all, all the ethnic groups, panta, tan, ethne. We've moved in a good direction since you know, the earlier centuries in realizing that's more than just geopolitical nations. These are people groups. But even Joshua Project has different numbers than some other missionary organizations to describe right, how many unreached people groups are there, how many of them, you know, what's the percentage. Some people have a greater percentage, some people have a lesser percentage. So this isn't exact science in saying, okay, we know exactly what defines a people group and what defines an unreached people group, and we know exactly what the Bible, the categorization that God says, okay, we need to make sure this percentage is reached, this many peoples, 
What we're commanded in the scriptures is to preach the gospel to all creation, and this gospel will be preached unto the ends of the world, and then the world will end, essentially. So our job as Christians is to continue to go out in the world, find the peoples that have not heard the gospel, and preach to them the gospel. I like the 1040 window. I like what the Joshua Project is doing, but I want you guys to be aware that this isn't like exact science we can turn to Matthew 28 and go, this, this is how many people groups there are in the world. We need to reach everyone. We're trying to do our best in realizing what is a people group, what distinguishes them from being unreached, and how we can best finish the Great Commission. But there are differing statistics. So maybe you'll have a certain mission organization like Operation World that'll say we've reached actually uh, more than 50% of them. Or some will say, you know, there's only 4,000 people groups left. So I just want you to take that with a grain of salt. There is differing statistics. So, All right, next slide, please. The 1040 window is home to the majority of the world's unevangelized countries. The unevangelized are people who have a minimal knowledge of the gospel but have no valid opportunity to respond to it. While it constitutes only one-third of Earth's total land area, nearly two-thirds of the world's people reside in the 1040 window. Remember, the original 1040 window included only countries that are at least 50% of their land mass within the 10 and 40 degrees north latitude. The revised 1040 window removes uh, several Christianized countries so, such as South Korea and the Philippines and includes several additional countries such as Indonesia that are close to the 1040 degrees north latitude and have high concentrations of unreached peoples. See the original revised country list again. These lists include both sovereign states and non-sovereign dependencies. Next slide, please. An estimated 3.28 billion individuals live in approximately 6,147 unreached people groups in the 1040 window. The 1040 window also contains the largest unreached peoples over 1 million in population. One more slide here. In addition, the 1040 window contains the overwhelming majority of the world's least evangelized megacities, that is those with a population of more than 1 million. The top, ten, or the top 50 least evangelized megacities are all in the 1040 window. The, that fact alone underscores the need for prioritizing 1040 window and Great Commission efforts. Now, I want to stop here for a moment. We in the missions team are, are developing and are working through, and Seth was doing this as well uh, before he stepped down, to really fall in line with this is that the greatest need right now is in the 1040 window. And though we don't want to rule out giving it to missionaries or supporting missionaries that aren't going to the 1040 window, we do desire to prioritize our giving and our support to missionaries that are within the 1040 window because this is where the greatest need is. This is where the greatest opportunity is. Yes, Chris. Uh, just a question on what is the process that Oak Ridge and you guys in the mission committee used yeah. to find new missionaries and uh is there a place for us say if we know missionary from you know in our personal lives or we meet yeah. someone to to bring it to you guys or is that yeah that's a good question so we do have an official document where we outline what needs to be checked off before we can consider someone to be uh, someone that we would give to officially as a church uh, and then obviously then there would be a process of uh, deliberating amongst the missions team and then bringing them forward to the congregation. Uh, and so, yeah, if you have anyone that you think of uh, that you feel like, wow, this would be a great addition to the people that we give to, please let us know. We will say that right now with our budget, we are kind of capped with the missionary families we're supporting. But that's not to say in the future budgets in the years as we continue to increase our percentage of giving to missions that we'll have more opportunities to expand the missionary families that we're supporting. One other thing quickly too is we are trying to support a good amount of missionaries, but we don't want to have so many that it's hard to really have good relations with them and that we're not giving them substantial amounts because we're spreading it all over the place. So. We do still want to hear about opportunities. We would love, please continue to come and tell us about new missionaries. But right now, there wouldn't be an opportunity until next year maybe to consider adding them on. But yeah, there is an official process that we go through. But please come, even if it doesn't work out, let us know about it. We would rather have you tell us about someone 
than just to think, oh, it was not going to work, don't, and don't say anything. Okay, next slide there, please, Stacy. thank you. The 1040 window contains four of the world's dominant religious blocks. The majority of the followers of Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism, as well as the non-religious bloc, which is like secular communism, live within the 1040 window. On the left side, you'll see this map in a second, on the left side or western part of the 1040 window, the Muslim world can be seen most prominently in a wide band across North Africa and the Middle East and South Asia. In the middle of 10, the 1040 window is the heart of Hinduism with its 33 million gods. Buddhism influences the right side or eastern part of the 1040 window. Buddhism is the primary religion in Southeast Asia. And although officially an atheistic country since the Marxist revolution of the late 1940s, China is nevertheless deeply influenced by Buddhist beliefs. So we can show this new map here. So that was what they were referring to there. The western side of the 1040 window is mostly Islamic. That doesn't mean that there isn't Islam in India or in other parts of Southeast Asia, but that's where the vast majority of the strongest holds are for Islam. And then Hinduism, mostly in the subcontinent of India, Buddhism in the Southeast port portion of Asia. And then when it says non-religious, it's really just secular, kind of atheistic communism in China and North Korea, you see that there. And then Japanese is kind of a mixture. There's, there's some animistic and kind of ancestral worship and things like that. But this is, a, this is a huge task that remains, as you can see. Islam still holds sway over many, many people. Obviously, so does Hinduism, as India is now the most populous country on earth, uh, and Buddhism, uh, obviously. So th that's kind of the breakdown of what we're looking at here. So not only are they unreached, they're not just simply general pagans that are just, you know, in ancient kind of ancestral things. It's, these are actual, many of them are believing a false religion, and they're, there are spiritual strongholds in their lives binding them to either these false gods in Hinduism or the false god of Islam as well. But that's, I think, another way to look at the 1040 window here is not only is it just a vast swath of people groups that just don't know the gospel or don't have an evangelical witness to them, these are the false religions and um, the mechanisms of the god of this world, the little g-god of this world, Satan, in controlling these people for their eternal destinies. And we, that, that needs to be what's on our mind here. And I'll, again, saying it in a better way, our priority needs to be the 1040 window, and that's what we're trying to do here at Oak Ridge. Uh, and so we want to continue to do that because this, I believe, is where we're going to see the completion of the Great Commission is reaching these peoples here. And there is great... I want you guys to know that it's not like no one is attempting this. There are many, many people, and many churches, many Christians that know about the 1040 window, that study it, that are being sent there, they're being raised up to go there. And so the fact is we are honing in, I believe, on the completion of the Great Commission. I don't know when that will be, but I think every Christian needs to pray and labor and hope that it'll be in their lifetime. I believe if the Lord willed, he could bring a great revival that swept millions and millions of those people in that 1040 window into his kingdom within a day. So the Lord, it's up to the Lord, but we need to pray and labor for that. And so I would just challenge all of us here as we're learning about the 1040 window, as we're discussing it, to bring that into your prayer life. Not only to, not only to pray for the completion of the Great Commission, but to pray specifically for the 1040 window and the billions of people within it that have no hope. And again, I'll give you another resource here that has really helped me make it more of a practical reality in my life. Um, Operation World is an organization that essentially their website and their book has been incredibly helpful to me. What they have on their website is essentially a 365 day prayer guide to the nations of the earth and the unreached peoples in those nations. If you go on their website, you can go on your phone or whatever, you can get signed up for an email, and they'll send you an email every single day, and you'll be praying for another, a new country every day, and they'll give you a complete layout of the percentages of unreached people groups in that nation, the, mo the biggest unreached people group in that nation, the predominant false religion in that nation, and the current state of the evangelical church in that nation. 
it was incredibly helpful for me to go through that one-year prayer program. It made me realize what's going on in each country, and you get an email reminder every day, and it helps you in your prayer life to be praying for all of these countries and all of these peoples. It's free, it doesn't cost you anything, and it's, the amount of work that went into pr producing that is incredible. And so we, we have these resources at our fingertips now in the 21st century as Christians. We have other Christians that are very smart and technologically advanced and have done this research and they're giving it to us for free. How can we not avail ourselves of this information to greater uh, enrich our prayer life and to be more engaged in the work of missions around the world? So before I move on to the very last, I think, few slides here, uh, does anyone have any questions, comments uh, about this element or any other of the elements of the 1040 window? Oops, Linnea then. Yeah, I guess I was just thinking through this. What, when we talk about unreached people groups and the populations in the 1040 window, obviously some countries have large populations yes. in developed cities that yep. might have the Bible translated into their primary language, yep. but it's, you know, not accessible or we don't, I guess I don't really know how accessible it is to download an app on your phone and have the scriptures, but right. how do we, I mean, compared to the Big Lake missionary that's literally developing a language right. for these people to read, but I guess maybe your perspective or yeah. how do we look at these dif distinctions and being unreached versus being aggressive towards Christianity or oppressive or yeah. you know, that sort of thing? That's a good question. I th I'm pretty sure the Joshua Project and others consider if there's a people group that have less than 1% of their peoples uh, believing the gospel or ha having heard the gospel, they, it's considered unreached. So it's a very teeny, teeny, teeny portion, or of course just none at all. So even if there's a teeny church, like a very small percentage are considered unreached, um, some of these are people that don't have a written language, as we saw in the Northern Korowai people. I don't think the majority of them are, is that case. I'd have to get back to you on this. I don't want to make false claims here. So I, I, I'm pretty sure in the research I've done, the studies I've done, I don't think the majority of the unreached people groups have an unwritten language. So there is a there is a path to get them the gospel, and that's what you know, Wyclef Bible translators and others like that are trying to basically, their goal is to translate the scriptures into every like, language on earth, like every written language on earth, and they're, they're doing well on that, they're advancing that. So yeah, I guess to your question, it, um, if a people group is less than 1% evangelized with an evangelical understanding of the gospel, they're considered unreached. I think mostly unreached people groups have a written language so that we have access to at least reach them with a language. But many of them live in countries where it is illegal to be a Christian, such as Iran. You know, Iran, if you're a Christian, you can be killed on blasphemy charges. Same with Pakistan or Afghanistan. But yet the church is advancing in Iran, and maybe we'll get a chance to look at that this, um, this, uh, this summer. But uh, right now, I think Iran and Nigeria, I think, are the fastest growing churches uh, on, on earth, the churches in Iran, and they're the most heavily persecuted. So even if a country is closed to the gospel, we can, it's, still, it's still possible to reach them. And we've seen that throughout the history of the world, that if you're willing to go, I think they said that, uh, I can't remember if it was the CT stud documentary or somewhere else, like, if you're willing to die, if you're willing to give your life for the gospel, you can go anywhere. The only thing that keeps us from getting in these countries is we're, we don't, and I'm not trying to say this like, you know, we're all cowards, I'm saying, like, literally, it's the only thing preventing us from getting the gospel sometimes of unreached people groups in closed countries is we, we don't know if we want to die. But if you're willing to die, you can go anywhere. And so, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, Jason, but, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of factors that go into it, especially with the mega cities. And I'll say this, too, really quick. Even here in America, like here in the Twin Cities, I think we're the most ethnically diverse city in the United States. There are unreached people groups that live here amongst us because we are a quote unquote modern mega city. So there's actually mission act activity that could go on even here right now. I mean, there's Somali Muslims, there's Turks, there's, there's so many different people groups that live within our context. So there is an element, and we don't have time to talk about this today, a, a discussion in missions which is the nations are coming to us too now. There's this interesting thing where it's like there's so much migration and immigration going on and there's so much globalization, there's so much connectivity that there's actually opportunities for people just to do a missions and evangelism here and actually reach unreached people groups that are living amongst us. 
So it, things are changing very rapidly. I mean, some of this stuff may be not even pertinent to our discussion like 10 years, but the point is, is that if a people group is less than 1% evangelized with the evangelical gospel. They're considered unreached and they need to take our priority. We have opportunities to reach most of them, I think, through written language. Uh, and obviously, the world is being more connected with the internet. So maybe we'll have opportunities with internet connection to reach them. So, Lene. Um, it's been a while that we've been hearing about thousands and thousands of Chinese people becoming believers. And we really need to pray for them specifically because um, as there's a book out on the book table called Back to Jerusalem. Mm. And it talks about how those Christians are determined to serve God in bringing the gospel to the 1040 window because they're seeing that the gospel started in, in Israel. And mm -hmm. they're seeing it that it has generally gone westward around the globe. Mm -hmm. And then back to them. <laughs> And so they want to bring it the rest of the way back to Jerusalem by ministering there among in that area. So it's an exciting thing to pray for and to watch. Yes. And that's something I was, I was hoping we will take a Sunday to look at. We'll think about it. But we cannot forget in the Great Commission, yes, we need, this, this gospel needs to be preached to all ethnic groups. And it needs to have the, the Gentiles need to have a witness. But we have to include Jews in this as well. There are millions of unreached, I mean, not unreached, but millions of Jews that do not believe in their Messiah, and they factor into this as well. And I think, yeah, there are many Chinese believers that have a, a heart for Jewish people. I've, I've, read, I've heard about that, too. Many in the Iranian church, too. These are, these are uh, people that you know, are taught to hate Jews, and the Christians in the Iranian church have a great desire that the Jews would come to know their Messiah. So, yeah, sorry, she's got one more. Oh. Right. They say they're not afraid to die. They yep. A lot of them will. Yeah. Yeah. So, we, yeah, we do need to be praying for the Chinese church. And they, the, you know what's really interesting, thank you for bringing that up, is there are many within the Chinese churches, African churches, many in these captive, in the 1040 window here where it's really hard to be a Christian, I have heard reports that they are praying for us because they realize that we don't really deal with persecution and it's very easy for us to kind of fall into this kind of laissez-faire life, and they, um, as much as we're praying for them, they're praying for us too, because their t faith is being tested, and they are being proven, and they are now, you know, many of them willing to die, and go anywhere for, the, for Christ, and so as much as they are praying, we are praying for them, they're praying for us too, because we need it uh, in a totally different way, so. Robin, did you have something there? Oh, okay. All right, so we've got 10 minutes left here, so let's try and finish. The 1040 window is home to the majority of the world's poor. Of the poorest of the poor, more than 8 out of 10 live in the 1040 window. On average, they exist on less than a few hundred dollars per person per year. It has been said that the poor are the lost and the lost are the poor. As the majority of the unreached live in the poorest countries of the world, there is a remarkable overlap between the poorest countries of the world and those that are least evangelized. Next slide there. The focus of the Christian missions community 200 years ago was for the coastlands of the world. A century later, the success of the coastlands effort motivated a new generation to reach the interior regions of the continents, which we saw with C.T. Studd and others. Within the past several decades, the success of the inland thrust has led to a majority focus on people groups. Today, followers of Christ are uh, concentrating their efforts on the unreached peoples of the world, most which are within the 1040 window. And so that's what I wanted to leave on today. For most of the history of the Christian church, there has been this view to kind of countries being unreached. But it's really been within the last hundred years that we've had our focus shifted towards people groups, not just geopolitical countries. And that is where the focus, I believe, needs to stay. We've seen a great advancement using the coastlands and uh, centuries before to evangelize these areas. And then we saw the inward thrust into the continents. And now, basically since the 1970s, we've been trying to concentrate on people groups. I believe it was in 1974, there was a World Missions Conference uh, and Ralph Winter got up and uh, was essentially giving a speech. He was a famous missionary and missiologist. 
And everyone was congratulating themselves because in the 70s, the gospel had, basically there was a gospel-believing church in every geopolitical nation on earth. And there was a much you know, applause and encouragement and there was great advancement. And he kind of brought to the assembly a greater charge saying, yes, every geopolitical nation has a church planted in it, a gospel-believing church, and we praise God for that. But there are a vast amount of unreached people groups within those countries, and that needs to be our concentration. And ever since then, that mindset has come into the missions organizations and missionaries. That, that needs to be our concentration to complete the Great Commission. So praise God, every nation on earth, every country on earth right now does have a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church in it. But we need to concentrate on the unreached in these nations as well. And that's going to be, I think, for our lifetimes, our task, our prayer, our efforts as we continue to pray, give, and go is to reach the unreached and to concentrate, Lord willing, on the 1040 window. So that was very fast, very brief. There's a lot more that could be said about the 1040 window. There's a lot of resources out on the table, and there's a lot of resources online at Joshua Project, at Operation World, that you guys can take advantage of to learn more. I don't have all the statistics with me and all the knowledge here about it. There's a lot more that could be said, so please avail yourself of these things to understand the needs out there. And um, Thank you for your attention this morning. I want to give the last five minutes or so here to any further questions and comments or any other things you might want to say, critiques, uh, things like that, and then we can finish with prayer. So, uh, just wanted to respond to an earlier question about uh, <clears throat> you know the the Bibles being in the people's languages. So, if you take the example of India, there's uh, you know both metropolitan cities as well as, you know, where there's a different, you know, it's a melting pot of different ethnicities, even though it's one country. Um, and uh, there's also, you know, people, remote tribes living in islands and, you know, remote hills and valleys where there's, you know, they don't have any roads or basically no civilization, right? So there's both. And, uh, uh, you know, being a little familiar with the sort of the Indian mission uh, scene or field. Uh, yeah, there are actually a lot of Bible translations projects going on, people reaching these unreached groups, yeah. trying to, you know, just like we saw with the Korowai, trying to actually create a script for some of these languages because a lot of these languages, you know, I was just looking up and I've heard in India there are about 1,300 languages, just, the, just languages, even more dialects. So many of these don't have scripts. You know, they try to create these scripts and, uh, you know, like, yeah, just uh, translate the Bible, translate the New Testament and then the Old Testament. You know, there are definitely a lot of projects, these types of projects going on. Um, and, uh, yeah, and uh, one more thing I wanted to point out is, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very diverse uh, um, sort of, of course, it's a large area. It's very diverse. You know, you have mountains, you have the Himalayas, you have deserts and valleys and hills, islands, and so on. And so you have a lot of different uh, diverse types of ethnicities and people, right, living in this 1040 window, different cultures, different languages. Um, and, uh, you know, when uh, Nick was talking about missionaries, I, I was reminded of uh, this young American uh, missionary. His name is John Allen Chow. If you guys haven't heard of uh, him, uh, I would encourage you to uh, look him up. He he went to uh, an island in India uh, where there's a group of unreached people called the Sentinelese. You know they, you know they are like no contact has been made with them. They are very hostile to external contact. You know he went in there and he tried to evangelize and he he died. Basically they killed him. You know so yeah, you know you. He basically uh, made a journal of his uh, journey there and his contact. And I would encourage you guys to, you know, like uh, read it if you haven't. Uh, yeah, I think just wanted to share that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I believe I'm aware of that story. That I think was that recently. That was like like in my last ten, five years. Yeah. 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 Oh, Corn's got one. Yeah, just to encourage. Um, 
I remember when I was back home as a teenager, I always go out for missions with my church or my fellowship group. I noticed most times when you go to the mission field, you find how you find other missionaries to go in there. Sometimes two, three missionary, mission, different missions group. Um, also when I was in uh, part of Europe, also in the Middle East, I was part of the, in the Middle East also, you still see people reaching out. I believe that there's a st God, the Lord is stirring people from the churches, you know, to send people out. And, and it's quite encouraging, you know, what we're doing, seeing what is going on, and be encouraged by that. It's, that's why I believe that the Lord is doing a quick work, you know, in our time, in our days. Mm -hmm. like I've seen more missions, missionaries going out in the field than we've known. Before years pass, yes. or when we read history, you'll see one man. Right. Like there was a guy that was in Nigeria that I used to tell my wife, we watch it. We, I told her, so we, she said we should watch a documentary about how it's called Pat John Elton. Okay, I told you to Nick about it last last yeah, yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pat John Elton, just one man who just, but now you see a lot of them. There's so much that their names are not just distinguished on the, or placed on the wall that, oh, this guy came here at this time. So much group, you know, and I praise the Lord for that. Amen. Yeah, amen. That's a good note, and we're going to end on that note here because. As much need as there is, there is great amount of activity going on. Now, some of it's not so great, but there is truly, we're seeing, we're living in a time where, where the, that great commission charge is being taken very seriously by the church, and there's great efforts being done. We need to pray, really, that the Lord would finish it in our lifetime. I don't think that's a, a bright, you know, too much of a prayer. Like we, we need to hope that the, the last of the elect would hear, even in our lifetime. Uh, and so let's, let's end on that note. Let's, let's take a time here uh, to finish and to pray for the unreached people groups of the world and for our missionaries and for our time. Well, Lord, our God, we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ for, first of all, saving us, Lord, for making each and every one of us, Lord, a part of the completion of the Great Commission, Lord. All of us were Gentiles, Lord, unbelieving peoples, Lord, and our ancestors were in paganism. We were in darkness without light, and someone came, a Christian with the gospel, and preached it to our people groups, Lord, our families, our cities, our contexts, and through them we believed. And we thank you for that, Lord, and help us to continue on doing this, Lord. Even if we do not feel called to go, Lord, help us to pray every day, Lord, for the mission of the church. Lord, we do pray even now on this Lord's Day, July 23rd, Lord, that you would complete the Great Commission through your church, even in our lifetime in this generation, Lord, that the remaining of the unreached people groups around the world would have a gospel witness to them soon, and that disciples would be made and baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and that the scriptures would be translated into the remaining languages that they need to be translated into, that there would be a witness for all peoples, O Lord, that the end may come. And we pray for the Jews, O Lord, the millions of Jews on this earth, O Lord, who are not trusting in you as their Messiah. We pray, Lord, you would open their hearts, that you would save many Jews, Lord, that many Gentiles and Jews would flood into the church, Lord, and that the fullness of the elect might come in. We praise you, Lord, for what you have done. We magnify for you for what you are doing, and we pray that you would use all of us in our lives to play our roles in the finishing of the Great Commission. We love you, Lord, and we pray that you would incline our hearts and our minds now to the worship of you, O Lord, who has called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.